good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you for the annual uh, Stone Center Lecture on Global Wealth, Gender, and Carbon Inequality. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you uh, here. And uh, we have an even larger audience online, including Jim and Kathy Stone, who are joining us from Boston, and who are, the, uh, who are so generously supporting the activities of the Stone Center. Thank you very much, Jim and Kathy. Um, our speaker today is Lucas Chancel, co-director of the World Inequality Lab. He's coming here to present uh, truly fundamental work uh, that he conducts in Paris uh, as co-director of the World Inequality Lab. The World Inequality Lab, under the leadership of Luca and Thomas Piketty, and thanks to the work of dozens of scholars in many, many countries, is producing what you could call a, a truly public good. Uh, it's a global database of income statistics, wealth inequality statistics, gender inequality, carbon emission, uh, that follows the highest scientific and, and statistical standards. And this is what is going to make possible hundreds of research papers in the years and decades to come uh, on inequality, to better understand the sources of rising inequality, to better understand the potential solutions to uh, this problem. And, and the work has very much already started. Many studies have been conducted in recent years. And they are summarized most recently in the World Inequality Report 2022. And this is what Luca is going to uh, talk about today. So please join me in uh, thanking Luca Chancel for being here today. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for the introduction. Um, Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here today, to be here in person. After many months of Zoom conferences and Zoom meetings, it, it's always great to, uh, to, to, to feel um, everything that, that happens in, in conference rooms and indeed uh, uh, interactions and exchanges are, are much easier uh, in, in this context. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd be very happy to, uh, to answer them. Uh, I think there, there's some time towards the end of the conference to, um, to do that, but also if at some point you would like to, uh, to, 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 you know, to raise uh, your hand and, and ask about a specific point, I think this is also what uh, being back in physical presence can make possible. So this, uh, this conference is entitled uh, Global Wealth, Gender, and Carbon Inequality, New Findings from the World Inequality Report. What's, what's interesting here is that um, I, I did another uh, uh, presentation, which was more of a, a, a book talk, but the funny part is that uh, it was also a, a Stone Center book talk, but from another Stone Center on the East Coast of the of the USA so uh, I had the east uh, the eastern moment and 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 it, it's um, it, I'm very happy to be here now for the the west part western part of the US uh, stone uh, stone conference uh, here uh, in in Berkeley and I would like to thank uh, so uh, so the the organizers uh, of the of the event Jim uh, and, and Kathy Stone and also of course Emmanuel and Gabriel for for the invitation so what I will be talking about today is mainly three, uh, three um, uh, different uh, uh, parts of this, of this presentation. The first one, which Gabriel referred to a minute ago, is really why we're doing all that, why we are producing uh, what we hope to see as, what we, what, what we would like to see as a global public good, that is inequality data. What, why are we doing that? Why we are spending so much time as researchers uh, producing this information, which many people could say, this should be the job of statisticians. Why researchers are producing that, this is what I will talk about in the first part of this presentation. Then, I'll say um, a few words, I'll spend some time um, talking about what we've learned from this project, what we've learned from the latest research on income and wealth inequality, 
Um, what is the level of wealth inequality in today's world? What have been the dynamics uh, over the past few years, over the past few decades? And also now we're able to go back two, century, two centuries backwards. Uh, so what do we learn from that, from a, subst from a substantive perspective? And the third part of the talk will be about exploring the new frontiers of global inequality research with two uh, topics here, one on gender and the other one on carbon inequality. I'll say a few words on gender and there will be much more in the World Inequality Report for all those of you who are interested in this work. In the interest of time, however, I'll focus a little more on the carbon part here uh, in, in, in part because this is also the topic of um, a book that I wrote a little before the World Inequality Report and on which the World Inequality Report also largely relies. So carbon uh, injustices will be in fact the third big part of this presentation. So let me, let me get uh, straight into it. So this is the, the cover of the World Inequality Report. So it was uh, edited with, uh, with Thomas Piketty, but also uh, what uh, Gabriel didn't necessarily uh, mention uh, is that himself and Emmanuel are also co-editors of this report. So this really is a truly uh, collaborative pr uh, project with basically two big pillars in this, uh, in this project, which is the Paris School of Economics and also uh, this hub here of inequality research in Berkeley. So this report, you can already find it online, and we see it really as uh, the, you know, the first systematic assessment of global income, wealth, gender, and carbon inequality over 30 years. All the data sets, all the uh, resources used to, to, to publish this report are available, open access online. This is part of our work to try to open up economic research, to open up these findings so that they can benefit all those who are interested in them. As I said a little earlier, third part of the presentation will be on another book, uh, which is, so this book published Harvard University Press 2020, and where I get a little more into the understanding of the complex set of interactions between the environment and between inequality. And basically, the, the key message here is that more unequal societies are societies where it's more difficult to tackle the environmental challenge. Uh, and to tackle the environmental challenge in unequal societies, this requires a, a radical rethinking of how, we, uh, of how we do social policy and how we do environmental policy. I'll say a few words on that later, later on. So let me let me start with the first uh, with the first point of this of this presentation: inequality data as a public good. The starting point is that um, inequality is everywhere, but still missing from most public statistics published uh, across the world. So we learn we know about inequality from you know uh, these leaks that have been uh, happening over the past. 15 years, every year, every six months now you have these new sets of leaks which, which tell us about you know, tax evasion, huge inequality in different parts of the world. We know also about these, uh, these rankings, uh, Forbes rankings, uh, the Bloomberg rankings which show this, this rise of billionaire wealth, uh, social movements which also tell us about rising inequality. But when you look at public statistics, you often don't see uh, the rise of billionaire wealth. You often don't see uh, the stagnation of big parts, big chunks of the population when it comes to income or, or, or to wealth. Or you, you do uh, see it, but uh, um, not as systematically, as precisely as we should be able to see it in order to really design effective policies to, to target what's happening, to tackle what's happening. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the problems with that is really a basic accounting issue in democracy. If you're not able to tell precisely who is benefiting from economic growth and who isn't, then it's very hard to uh, you know, design, review public policies and economic policies. And it's very hard to uh, basically do our you know, basic duties as, as citizens, which is to say, you know, whether we want this or that government to be 
uh, continued in, 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 in office if we're not able to evaluate its economic policies properly without this, this data. So the data we're producing really tries to distribute economic growth to make it possible for everybody in a society to know who is benefiting from economic policies and who's losing from that. This work, um, in fact, originates a few decades back. Um, first, in the, in the pioneering work of, uh, of Kuznets in the 1950s, looking at the evolution of inequalities, mobilizing tax data, combining this with uh, national accounts to understand, over a long time span, what is happening to top income groups or top wealth groups in the economy. This work was also carried out by uh, Tony Atkinson in the, in the late 70s. And then um, also um, uh, the project was uh, restarted, at least the modern version of this project was started, restarted by Thomas uh, Piketty in the early 2000s, with, along with Emmanuel Saez, and then a growing number of researchers surely from all places in the world. Facundo Alvarado, Gabriel Zuckman, and many dozens and dozens of scholars contributed to the Top Income Shares project, which led to the creation of the World Top Income Database in the, in the early to mid-2010s. Um, this project is essential for the work that I'm going to show after, but was not sufficient in the sense that we were just looking at top income shares. Wealth was largely missing from the analysis, and um, we were also not necessarily looking at all forms of incomes that, uh, that individuals might, might receive. And so from the mid-2010s onwards, the project was enlarged, and um, um, it started to focus not only on top in income groups, but also on the bottom of the distribution. So what is happening to inequality within the 99%? Looking at what we call fiscal income, what's whatever is visible on tax receipts, but also um, non-fiscal income, some forms of capital incomes, dividends that may not necessarily show up in the tax data, in the, in the information that was initially mobilized in this project, in order to have a more holistic, a more comprehensive view of really how the totality of national income, of economic growth, is distributed, is shared to different groups of the population. And this led to the creation of the World Inequality Database. So looking at income, at wealth, really from the most macroeconomic perspective perspective possible and distributing this to each group of the population. I won't get too much into the methodological details today, but all these details are summarized in um, the distributional national accounts guidelines, which are really the scientific contribution, the methodological contribution of this project. And this document indeed involves uh, dozens of, of researchers as well. Maybe two points that I'd like to mention here is that uh, what we call DINA, so distributional national accounts, really tries to use the strength of all data sources. So tax data, national accounts, but also rich, li uh, rich lists, leaks. We try to make the most of the strength of each of these data sources. Um, and we develop a flexible approach to combining these sources together, an approach that is able to accommodate for very different uh, data context. In certain countries, like this country, in the US, there's more data available than in uh, many uh, lower income countries of this world. But we still try to produce estimates and numbers for all countries in the world, factoring in the, the, the different types of difficulty in accessing these different sources of data. We try to do this always in a transparent and systematic matter. It's also a cumulative and collaborative process. By this I mean that we always welcome new researchers, new colleagues uh, to come in the, in the project and to help us to improve all these series. So we really see this again as a collaborative public good um, in which in fact 
More than 100 researchers have contributed since the beginning of the project, and I won't be able to name uh, all of them. Some of them are here uh, in, in, the, in the room today, but really it's, it's in fact, on a more personal note, it's it's a it's a truly fantastic adventure to be part of a, you know a research project which is as collaborative as this one. Very often, you know, uh, people see research as a as a very solitary work, and in fact, in this in in this project, we see really the the power, the strength of working with this strong uh, uh, level of of, of collaborations with with colleagues. Um, talking about collaborations. What we've been doing over the past five, six years is really trying to strengthen institutional collaborations. Why are we doing this? Well, because at some point, we would really like that this work that is done here is not done by researchers anymore, but by public institutions, by uh, uh, statistical agencies, whose, you know, ultimately should be their job, basically, to publish this kind of statistics. So we've been developing strong partnerships with, uh, in particular, the United Nations, United Nations Development Program and United Nations Statistics Divisions, because it is this very institution that, you know, ultimately uh, uh, should take over this kind of project. And this is what was done, by the way, for GDP. GDP was initially developed, invented by researchers, Cousinets, Keynes, among others. And, you know, by the end of the 1940s, early 1950s, then the UN took over and then standardized these concepts. And it's largely because of the role of the UN that GDP has been playing uh, this fundamental role in how, you know, policymakers have been seeing the economy since then, since the, the beginning of the 1950s. So that's why we, we, we developed these partnerships uh, also with national statistical uh, agencies at the country level and partner institutions. This really is, you know, there's a very wide ecosystem now of researchers focusing on inequality and we're faced with common challenges. That is the heterogeneity of data, the lack of common standards to track different forms of incomes, different types of wealth, but we have common goals. And these goals really is how will the public data system of the 21st century look like? Um, and our answer to that is, so the World Inequality Database, www.wid.world, um, www where we now cover you know, more than 140 countries with uh, aggregated and distributional income and wealth estimates and with also novel estimates on gender and carbon inequalities, as Gabriel was mentioning earlier. Okay, so that's for the what we do and how we do it part um, and why we do it. And now what are we learning from this, from this work? It's not just about collecting data, it's also trying to understand about, you know, what is happening and essentially also what we can do about it. So what, what have we learned from recent research on global income and wealth dynamics? I'll start with this graph, which um, tells us about you know, the level of um, the concentration of income and wealth across the world today. So here we have these three key indicators, the share of income accruing to the bottom 50% of the population to the middle 40% of the population, and to the top 10% of the population. Same thing for wealth on the right-hand side of the graph. So in a perfectly equal society, the bottom 50% of the population would get 50% of the total. The top 10% would get 10% of the total. In a perfectly unequal world, the top 10% would get 100% of the total. So in terms of income, what we observe at the global level is a, a top 10% capturing about half of the total and the global half of the population making around a little less than 10% of, of, total, of total income. Uh, so that's a important, substantial level of inequality of income concentration at the, at the world um, level, but looking at wealth, and this might not necessarily be a surprise to uh, many of you, uh, the level of concentration is even starker, even more important, whereby 10% of the population own about three quarters of the total, 
and a half of the world population owns close to nothing at all. Um, what is, I think, important to reveal beyond these global numbers, these global statistics, is what is happening within countries and between world regions. And this is where the, the interesting parts come in. Because looking at the diversity of inequality regimes across the world tells us about what we can do and perhaps what we should not do uh, if we want to contain to limit inequality. So this is income concentration across world regions where you see to some, you know, to some extent a wide diversity of inequality regimes. Look at Europe, for instance, where the bottom 50% of the population gets about 20% of total income. This is to be uh, contrasted with North America, the bottom 20%, 50% uh, of the population gets a little more than 10%, 13% of the, of the total, significantly uh, less than in Europe. And in the most unequal reg regions of the world, poorest half of the population, less than 10% of, of, uh, of the total. So uh, the, the, the most unequal regions of the world we see here have a level of inequality that is to some extent comparable to the world as a whole if we compare this graph with the, with the previous one. But what I'd like to stress here, one of the key messages is the diversity of income inequality regimes. And I'll say a few words in a minute about the fact that we've also observed over the past decades a diversity in the trajectories followed by these different regimes. And this can um, uh, teach us a lot of important things about, about policy. Talking about policy and um, how to tackle inequality, one of the new findings of the World Inequality Report 2022 is this focus that we place on looking at inequality before taxes and after taxes. And what this graph tells you is, um, uh, so basically the gap between the average income of the top 10% of the population divided by the average income of the bottom 50% of the population. Um, and on the horizontal axis, you have this gap measured before taxes. On the vertical axis, you have this same gap, the same indicator, but measures according to income after taxes. And what you see here is that uh, uh, the line is, is you know, uh, the, 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 all the dots, so all the countries in the world follow this, uh, this, this close to, to, straight, to straight line. What does this mean? This means that a big part of the differences in inequality levels that we observe across the world, across countries, uh, 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 after taxes, are actually already there when we look at inequality before taxes. So this, this, this is pretty important. This means that pre-distribution policies are very, uh, very important, very significant to determine what is going to be the inequality level in a country versus another country. By pre-distribution, I mean minimum wage, regulations, but also public services and access to public services. Um, this, you know, I think this should be uh, understood, looked at in the context of uh, what we've also said before, what we've said earlier in this project about the role of taxation, the role of progressive taxes. And in fact, the two messages are not contradictory at all. Because to finance public services, to finance equal access to health, to education, to transportation, to culture, you need a decent amount of public resources. In order to finance these public uh, resources, you need taxes and you need progressive taxes. I'll come back to that a little later on. But this really is about understanding the joint role of pre-distribution mechanisms and redistribution mechanisms, i.e. progressive taxes, in our understanding of these inequality regimes. I'll come back to this uh, uh, a, little, a little later on. Now, let me turn to to wealth inequality. When looking at income, we observe that uh, some world regions are doing it a little better than others with uh, being able to contain e income inequality. When we look at wealth, well, in fact, 
you know, uh, all regions are doing it pretty, pretty bad. Uh, look at the share of uh, wealth uh, owned by the bottom 50% of the population. In all regions of the world, this is actually lower than 5%. So basically, the poorest half of the, of the population, no matter where, which country you look at in the world, owns close to nothing. Uh, 2%, 3%, maybe 5% in, in some European countries. Uh, but, but still, this share is extremely, extremely low. So if there's one thing that we learn here from, from this, this new data, this new global wealth inequality coverage, is, is the, 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 the fact that wealth inequality is extreme everywhere, and there's a, a lot of, of, of work to be done not only in emerging countries, but also in the very rich uh, world. So that's for the picture today. What uh, have we learned about the dynamics, about the evolution of income and of wealth inequality? I, I'll say a few words on income again to start with, and then I'll move to, to wealth in, in a minute. So this is the share of national income according to the top 10% of the population in some of the world key regions. And what you see here is that, you know, we have here regions or countries that have very different ways to organize their political systems, their economic systems, uh, their social systems. But in the 19, 1980s, in terms of the concentration of income, there was relative homogeneity in these, uh, uh, throughout these regions. And what is very striking here is that inequality seems to have been rising in most places, all of these regions here, but as, at very different speeds. And we take, you know, uh, we discuss this at length in the report, but these differences are very important for our understanding of inequality because they reveal the, the, the impact, the role of policies. Looking at such divergences in trajectory makes it very difficult to say that the rise of inequality is actually due to tech or is actually due to globalization per se. It has, it has much more to do with uh, policy choices, uh, taxation choices, choices in terms of the regulation of the labor market. So policy matters and it matters uh, uh, substantially. I'll skip this uh, graph in the interest of time, and uh, I'll move now to wealth inequality and to the, the dynamics of wealth inequality um, since the 1990s. This, again, is a new result from the World Inequality Report 2022. We're not able to, to produce uh, these kinds of estimates in, in, pre in previous reports. And what we observe is... Um, along with the rise of income inequality, a very strong rise of wealth concentration worldwide. So this kind of graph um, was popularized by colleagues, uh, including Branko Milanovic and, and, and co-authors. And co so what you have on, on, on this graph on the vertical axis here is the, the, the total uh, global population ranked from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right-hand side of the graph. For each of these percentiles of the wor world population, um, what the vertical axis shows you is the per adult annual growth rate in wealth, um, net of inflation. So how, you know, what is the rate of growth of, uh, of your wealth? And what this graph shows is this, uh, you know, three sides to globalization, uh, so to say. Um, one, a globalization that is associated to um, um, a relatively positive picture, so that's a rise in, 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 in wealth for, you know, percentiles in the, towards the middle of the global wealth distribution, percentile 40 to, say, percentile 70 to 80. So that's the rise of emerging country, the rise of the emerging middle class, where wealth has been, has been growing at 4% uh, per year on average over this period of time, so that's a substantial increase. Another uh, side to the story here is the relatively uh, uh, negative side to globalization. So the compressed middle class in rich countries with wealth growth rate uh, lower than 3% per year, in some countries even much lower. And then the third side to what has been happening over the past 30 years, the very positive uh, uh, development 
for a very small group of the population. So wealth growth rate of 6%, 7%, 9% per year on average. So that's a substantial uh, growth over time. Substantial growth, which translates indeed in rising shares for the top 0.1% or the top 0.01% in total wealth. So that's what you see on this graph. Red curve on this graph shows the share of wealth captured by a tiny group of the population, that's about 50,000 adults today, the top 0.001% of the population from about a little more than 3% of the total to more than 6% of the total, so a doubling of its share of total wealth. Whereas at the same time, what happened to the bottom 50%? Well, clo close to no rise at all. Remember, they have been capturing just 2% of total wealth growth over the period. So why did it happen like that? What, you know, why has the distribution of wealth growth been so unequal over the, over the years? One of the, the answers, one of the reasons that we also discuss more at length in the report is, is it, it's these fundamental dynamics that were happening here. Uh, so this is a development based on the earlier work of, uh, of Gabriel and, and Thomas on uh, you know, the fact that you know, private capital is coming back, it's, it's, ri it's rising. So nations are becoming richer, capital is rising back, uh, but governments are becoming poor. And the wealth of government is actually the wealth, at least in democracies, of people who don't own wealth. The wealth of government is the wealth of those who do not have uh, assets of their own. So public services, public enterprises, which in many countries have been sold by governments to the private sectors, sometimes at low cost, uh, and which also contributed to this rise of, of private capital, of private wealth. Another reason behind the decline of public wealth here is the rise of, uh, of, public, uh, of public debt. But what is very important here is, is two things. First, the rise of private wealth is, uh, is, is, is really a sustain a very strong here trend that we observe. And despite you know, uh, moments of you know, booms and busts of uh, real, say, real estate uh, uh, bubbles or the dot-com bubble in some countries, you still do see this, continua this continuation of the rise in, in private wealth. And the other key important point that I'd like to uh, attract your, your, your attention to is in some rich nations, namely the UK and also this country, net public wealth, so that's the total value of assets owned by the government minus its debts, is close to zero or below zero uh, when we express this as, as a uh, share, as a percentage of national Income. What does this mean? This means that if the U.S. government wanted to repay all its debts by selling all its assets, so all its roads, all its infrastructure, all uh, the schools that may still own, uh, perhaps not that many, but if it wanted to sell everything uh, to private uh, individuals, it would not even be able to repay all its debts. And then U.S. citizens would live in a country where any kind of infrastructure uh, would be held by private hands. Any kind of infrastructure would need uh, to potentially uh, be entered with, with a paying, paying a fee. This is, this is the very uh, s important, I think, uh, uh, takeaway from, from this kind of, uh, of result. Um, let me check the time. Okay, so this is the, uh, some of the results that you'll find in the World Inequality Report for the recent period. A novelty from the report is that we're now able to go back um, two centuries backwards, thanks really to the you know whole set of, of new studies that were done over the past years on the long run evolution of income inequality in India, in Russia, in Brazil, in South Africa. So we initially had some studies of the like for uh, uh, Western countries. And over the past few years, we're able to develop these studies looking at tax data, for instance, in India, starting uh, at the late uh, 19th century. So we're now able to produce these new results about global income inequality 
over the past two centuries. And the key here takeaway, I think, is the following. So here we, we're back to this indicator, which I referred to once uh, earlier. That's the, the ratio of the uh, average income of the uh, top 10% of the population to the average income of the bottom 50% of the population. But now let's at the global level. What we observe on this graph is a strong rise of this, uh, this gap. Let's call it the top 10, bottom 50 uh, gap between 1820 and 1900. So that's the rise of Western uh, imperialism and that, this, that is the strong rise of inequality between countries that's happening at this, this period of time. What's happening after between 1900 and today a lot of upheavals, a lot of you know, uh, important dynamics, shocks to the global economy, to countries. But the key point here is that the level of concentration of income in 2020 uh, might be slightly uh, lower than what we observed in the 1980s, but still is similar to the way incomes were Concentra was concentrated at the peak of Western imperialism at the beginning of the 20th century. So the world is organized very differently today than 100 years back. Uh, decolonization process uh, uh, um, happened, uh, but what we, what we show here is that we're still far from living in a world that's uh, completely, uh, com com from, from, from the economic perspective, completely out of the you know, international hierarchies, economic hierarchies that were developed during the colonial system. Uh, and I think this, this is also an interesting uh, uh, takeaway and result from, from this part of the World Inequality Report of this year. With this other with this other result here, uh, which now is is what it's t this graph is telling us about when we think about global inequality, we may wonder what's driving it. Is it inequality between countries, or is it what's happening within countries? Is it inequality in average incomes between an average person in China and an average person in the U.S., or is what's driving global inequality what's happening within the U.S.? So uh, between a, a very poor American and a very rich American, and similar in, in China. What this graph tells us is that we are back in 2020 in a world where most of global inequality is actually due to what is happening within countries. Uh, um, and, and on top of uh, continued strong inequalities between countries. So what this graph tells us is that there are big inequalities between countries, but even bigger inequalities within uh, countries today. Okay, so that's already, you know, a quite, uh, I think, dense presentation so far, uh, looking at, you know, these kind of two standards dimensions of income and, and wealth inequality. So made possible by, by these two decades of research on, on income and, and wealth dynamics, mobilizing tax data, national accounts, and, and rich lists. Now I'd like to turn to these new frontiers of global inequality research. And so I'll show you just maybe one result, one graph on the gender part, and then, then I'll try to move on to, to the carbon uh, dimension. So on gender, maybe it's just, just to give you a taste on what you would find in the report, and, and happy also to discuss this more during, during the, the, the Q&A &A session. Uh, this is largely based on the work of uh, Teresa Neef and Anne-Sophie Robillard, two colleagues that have been uh, leading this work on gen global gender parity. What you have here is a new indicator to track gender inequ inequities worldwide, and that really is the share of all labor incomes accruing to women at the world level. What, you, what we see is that uh, uh, women in 1990 get 30% of all labor incomes. This share has risen to thir a little less than 35%. So we're still very far from parity. That's 50%. And in fact, it would take about 100 years to, to get there. Uh, I won't get into, into, this, into this more, so I will skip these, uh, these graphs. Maybe I'll keep them for the discussion uh, for the time being to try to, to save 
a little more time for 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 this for this part on on global carbon inequality but happy to to discuss uh the gender part uh uh in in a few in a few minutes so turning to environmental inequalities the question really is how we develop uh, climate policies in, in an unequal world. So how we develop, uh, uh, you know, deep decarbonization policies, we need to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050 in a world with the, the kind of inequalities that we've observed before. This, uh, this is, uh, as I was saying, also uh, the, the topic of, of this book. Um, the, the point is that Climate, and some pictures to try to uh, make this presentation a little lighter with a little less graphs. Uh, graphs will come back in a few minutes, don't worry. But uh, So climate policies blind to equity concerns are actually likely to fail. So what happened in 2018 in France, for instance, is a government that implements a carbon tax that puts a big part of the population to the street saying that, uh, well, actually, this tax doesn't look pretty uh, equal or fair to us, and why would we pay it uh, in a context where uh, you're you know, putting the, the, this new tax on carbon uh, at the pump, but you're not taxing uh, kerosene for aviation. So uh, as low or middle income um, uh, individuals, working groups, we have to pay the carbon tax when we go to work, but rich individuals taking a jet from Paris to the French Riviera are not taxed at all on their carbon. And at the same time, this carbon tax was presented in the context of a larger tax overhaul through which large uh, tax rebates, gifts were given to the top 1% of the population. So effectively, a transfer of tax money from low-income people, middle-income people, to the very rich. So this didn't work particularly well, and the tax was, uh, was frozen. It was, the, the reform was abandoned. This is not only about you know, a French uh, situation uh, uh, or a European situation, in countries like Indonesia over the past decades, you've been, we've been seeing that kind, of, uh, that kind of movements. So Indonesian governments wanted to remove fossil fuel subsidies in the 2010s. So effectively, this means hiring the price of fossil fuels. And this you know, put a lot of people uh, out in the streets because low-income, middle-income groups were disproportionately impacted by these reforms. This is also visible in uh, U.S. policy debates, uh, at least uh, in, my, in my opinion, my perspective, when you listen to why Donald Trump, how did he, mod how did he motivate his exit from the, climate, the Paris Climate Agreement a few years back? Uh, th this, is, this might indeed be a very cynical use of these tensions between uh, uh, inequality and the environment, but the fact that these tensions are, are, are used by some actors and echo and have some, uh, some weight, some relevance for uh, some citizens, some workers of certain industries is important. And the, what w Trump was saying is that, well, climate policies are going to hit uh, workers of these uh, of some disadvantaged uh, sectors of the of the country of some mining sectors and we need to protect them we need to protect the American workers and you know going big for the environment at least as the Democrats want to do is going to be bad for them so we shouldn't do that so here again might be a very cynical way to look at the at, 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 at the issue from Trump's perspective, but there is a case to better understand what's happening, better understand what's at stake, and how to make sure that climate policies uh, can cope with uh, these inequality, inequality concerns. By the way, uh, current chaotic events with uh, the, 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 the invasion, the war uh, uh, in, in Ukraine, as uh, we've already started to see, are going to increase energy prices. So that's the, the oil price per, per barrel. So we're already very close to the, to the price of crude oil, inflation adjusted uh, of the uh, late 70s uh, oil, oil crisis. We're not here, uh, yet at a, at a level of uh, the 2008 peak. We'll probably soon be there. So these tensions between um, the, the, you know, the rise of energy prices, are we going to try to develop you know, uh, um, policy responses to that that are going to protect the environment 
or not, that's really a question. I see a lot of uh, governments in the world saying that we should kickstart coal again to try to make up for, for the lack of Russian gas or that we should loosen regulations on fracking, for instance, again, to try to make up for uh, the fossil fuels that we won't be able to import from, from Russia or Ukraine. So here we see again, you know, potentially the exacerbation of tensions that we were going to see anyway in the coming decades by 2050, where the price of fossil fuels needs to increase massively uh, if we really want to be able to uh, uh, solve the climate uh, problem, the climate uh, crisis. Um, so what we're trying to do in the World in Equality Reports is first to present basic facts about the problem. And some of these basic facts, as simple as they may uh, seem, are not necessarily uh, uh, discussed uh, in, in many other publications. And so I'd like to, you know, say a few, a few you know, words, a, a, a few points about, about, these, about these facts. So about, you know, carbon emissions worldwide, who, em is, who is emitting what today? And in order to understand uh, the, the large inequalities in carbon emissions, I think we need to start with that, kind of, uh, with that kind of thing. So today, at the world level, every year, humanity is emitting about 50 billion tons of CO2, of carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases. According to our physicists and earth scientists friends, we have 900 such billion tons left if we want to keep global temperatures below two degrees. If we want to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees, we have just 300 billion tons left. So we're emitting 50 billion tons every year. So if we want to keep below 1.5 degrees, less than 10 years, about six years left. So that's why a lot of people say 1.5 degrees won't be possible uh, today. So what does this mean in terms of what is our uh, carbon budget? So that's what humanity as a whole, now let's try to look at the individual level. And this is, by the way, what we're also always trying to, to do in this World Inequality Database project is to try to reconcile macroeconomic approaches with microeconomic approaches, how the individual uh, uh, is important here. So if I split these two budgets, the 300 billion tons budgets or the 900 billion tons budgets, if I split it equally across the entire world population living between today and 2050, when we need to be to at zero tons of carbon, this means, according to the 1.5 degree budget, around 1.1 ton of carbon emitted per person per year. So that's the equally split carbon budget between now and 2050. Multiply this by three, you get the 900 billion tons, so the, the two, two degree carbon budgets, about 3.3, 3.4 tons per, per carbon per person per year. Where are we today? So that's per capita emissions by region. So at the world level, an average human being emit every year, emits every year 3.6 tons of carbon every year. You see in green our two equality, equality, equally split budgets, right? 1.1 ton, 3.6 four tons. North America, about 21, ton, 21 tons. So that's, uh, that's the average uh, in, in this part of the world. Only two world regions here are close to our equally splits budget. Sorry, budgets. Sub-Saharan Africa, South, Southeast uh, Asia. By the way, do we have a good uh, uh, common understanding of, of, uh, of, of, of what 1.1 ton of carbon is, for instance? What is the per capita carbon footprint of, of a, a trip, you know, international uh, transatlantic trip from, say, here to Paris? Anyone has a, an idea of that? Any, any guess? So that's 1.6 tons approximately, just one-way trip economy class. So you're already over the, the 1.5 equally split budget. You're slightly lower uh, than, the, than the two degree, but if you do the return, then you've, you've, you've done your entire, your entire budget. Talking about uh, uh, carbon budgets, let's, let's do the same exercise for uh, per capita carbon footprint of a leisure trip to space. So 
This happened in 2020, right, during the COVID crisis. Indeed, it's related to what we were discussing before. So when you have so much wealth in the hand of, of very few individuals, they don't really know what to do anymore with it. And what they're doing is, so this is hard to estimate indeed, but uh, so preliminary estimates, uh, we're able to find that it's probably 100 or 200 tons of CO2 for just one ticket, one trip, 10 minutes. Uh, that's how much you, you emit uh, uh, with, with that kind of uh, leisure uh, activity. So the point is, there are very vast, very wide inequalities beyond these averages, right? Uh, very wide inequalities in emissions. And that's what our new database makes it possible to track. So, so I'm back to our more standard indicators, the, the ones we've seen before, bottom 50% of the population or top 10% of the population. These are tons of uh, CO2 emissions per person per year. Uh, so again, to be compared to our two budgets or you know, the 3.4 tons per person per year, if we want to stay below, uh, before, below two degrees. Let's look at North America. So poorest half of the population is at 10 tons. Top 10% of the population is 73 tons. So this is for US and, and, and Canada. The point I want to make here is that, um, well, you have, if we look at you know, East Asia, where China is, is going to play the you know, overarching role, and, and Europe, you have very high emitters in middle or low income regions, and you can have low emitters in rich regions. So look at Europe, for instance, the bottom 50% of the population emits five tons of carbon per person per year. We're, we're above the, you know, the equally split two degree budget, the 3.4 tons equally splits, but we're not that much over it. So the key point here is that carbon inequality is not just a rich versus poor country issue. There are very high emitters in, in uh, poor countries and very low emitters in rich countries as well. In fact, today, uh, there is more inequality with carbon inequality within countries than uh, between countries. That's another result, key result of this of this uh, report. Um, let me let me jump to this to this uh, to this result, which I think is is pretty important and, and significant. So. This is a similar representation which, uh, to, to the one I was referring to for wealth inequality, the elephant curve, so-called, of inequality and growth. So except, so here I'm, I'm looking at the entire world, the world population, ranked from the lowest emitters to the, to the highest emitters, uh, 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 the smallest emitters on the left, highest emitters on the, on the right. What you see is that, um, a part of the world population is below the, the red line. So what this means effectively is that their emission levels, per capita emission levels, of a part of the population corresponding to low-income groups and middle-income groups in rich countries has been declining over since 1990. So there has been a reduction in per capita footprints for some groups of the population in rich countries. This is a combination of two factors. One, um, economy-wide energy efficiency gains after the oil crisis of the 1970s, or early 1980s. And two, the contraction of their income. So one factor is positive, the other one is not as positive at all. But the point is, they have been re reducing their, their carbon footprints, whereas if you look at the top 1% of the global population, or the top 1% of the population in rich countries, carbon footprints have been increasing, increasing over, the, over the previous uh, decades. And so I think you know, this is something that should be factored in how we think about how we design climate policies. And so far, it is uh, not often the case. Let me skip this slide in the interest of time. I was just saying here that there's now more emissions inequality within countries than between countries. Um, and what I'd like to perhaps just recap what I've said so far. What I've shown is that there is a large level of uh, income and wealth inequality at the global level. Income and wealth inequalities have been rising within countries. This rise of income and wealth inequality is also associated to a rise of pollution inequality. 
um, the wealthiest, the highest income groups pollute significantly more than other parts of the population. This is what we see in micro-level surveys when we really look at you know, the granularity of the data that's available. So this translates into large pollution inequal uh, 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 inequalities in, in pollution. Now what we also know is that the continuation of these trends in terms of pollution will further exacerbate the level of inequalities throughout the world. Climate change is going to exacerbate gaps in average incomes between countries. In fact, we've already been seeing this over the past decades. Low-income countries have already been hit hardest by uh, heat waves that we've already observed. So if, if uh, you want more about that, have a look at the latest uh, IPCC Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. This impact of, cli on, of climate change on inequality is also true within countries. Within poor countries, low-income people are more exposed to, uh, to heat waves, uh, to uh, uh, other forms of, of climate-related uh, negative impacts. This is true within poor nations, but also within rich nations. In a country like the US, low-income groups are often more exposed to environmental risks and also more vulnerable to these risks. Don't get me wrong here, we're all in the same boat when it comes to climate change. We're all exposed to climate change, but just not all in the same way. And perhaps one illustration of this, pictures are back, uh, a, a caricatural but a real way to illustrate this difference in exposure to climate change, a few thousand kilometers east uh, words uh, of us is the survival condo project in the Kansas desert, whereby with a couple of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, you can buy this, this luxury, so to say, condo uh, that would protect uh, yourself from massive uh, uh, you know, climate stress. And so this is just to illustrate against the fact that in societies where parts of the population may feel that they can protect themselves better than others against climate chaos, are societies that will have more, more troubles, more difficulties to move forward in implementing uh, um, climate, climate, uh, climate policies. So how do we protect the environment in an unequal world? Really, that, that is the key question here. For uh, many decades, actually since the 1990s, the economics profession has been largely advocating a flat tax on carbon. And if you were you know, coming forward with this idea of a flat tax on carbon, a lot of colleagues would be you know, very, uh, very positive about that. So yeah, let's uh, bring back together the, the, the marginal private cost of producing you know, polluting goods with the marginal social cost for society as a whole. And if we equalize these two costs, we will reduce the quantity of pollution produced. The problem is that here there is this mismatch between uh, this th th this view of of, of uh, you know climate policies and how it can uh, effectively uh, 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 be be felt in in, um, in in the real world, whereby carbon taxation is actually often regressive. Uh, it's in, um, in particular the, the types of taxes of carbon taxes that were implemented in practice without compensation packages for low income groups have actually hit consumers without alternatives. So if the price of carbon increases at the pump, but you don't have public transportation alternatives, you cannot buy an electric car, so you have to choose between going to work or, uh, uh, or basically uh, going to work but having to pay the, 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 the carbon tax and being you know, largely constrained then in your disposable income or not going to work anymore, you won't pay the tax, but you won't have any income. And this is actually the situation that we have observed in many, in many countries uh, in, in the world. And here I'd like to come back on, on these graphs that I was presenting before, showing the inequality uh, of emissions uh, by, you know, the poorest here, 50% in the US, emit half you know, the, the average levels of emissions. So the poorest 50% would be the groups that are the most impacted by policies such as flat tax on carbon at the pump. 
But the point is, and that will be the, what we'll see in the next graph, is that this group of the population is actually already at the level of emissions that the U.S. has planned to be by 2030. So after the Paris Climate Conference, all countries in the world have established tar climate targets. So that's uh, targets of, in 2030, where will we be on the road towards net zero emissions in 2050? So the U.S. has established some targets, France established some targets, India, etc., established targets. These targets are never... Uh, uh, published are never presented as per capita targets. They're always presented as economy-wide targets. But here I'm, I'm presenting these targets in per capita value so that we understand what this means. And this is, the, for the US, the 2030 targets effectively means 10 tons of carbon emitted per capita per year. And so this is actually the, the, the current level of emissions of the poorest half of this population. And so this is, you know, this means actually a significant reduction for the middle 40%, the middle class, and the wealthy class in this country, who often are not particularly well targeted by climate policies. Would a tax on carbon really, uh, uh, you know, be uh, efficient, effective uh, at limiting uh, space travel? We can, we can, we can question this, uh, and and. You know, more particularly, flat taxes of, on, on carbon are not necessarily always the, 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 the right uh, solution here. So a key takeaway is that when we think about climate policy design, so either when we want to address how energy is produced or how energy is distributed, that's the middle column, or how energy is used by end users, that's you and me at home, what kind of devices we have, we can have several types of policies and we need to ask more and more about, you know, are we, uh, are we targeting the bottom 50%, the middle class, the top 1% with the types of policy that we, that we are implementing? I won't be able to discuss all these cells of the matrix, so have a look at the World Inequality Report if you're interested in that. What I'll just say maybe a, a few final comments here. Um, one is that there's a, another key dimension here, which is time. In some countries, uh, implementing taxes on carbon might be relatively progressive in the sense that if you have low-income or middle-income groups that have not yet adopted carbon-intensive uh, lifestyles, then it's possible in these countries to tax carbon uh, at the pump, for instance, you'll be targeting the top uh, uh, the wealthiest part of the distribution. In 10 years, it might be too late. So that's a window uh, of opportunity here. That's, uh, that's an important time dimension to add to this three by three matrix that I was presenting before. And um, another point to have in mind, I think is some countries have actually done this relatively well. So no country is, is perfect, but just one example here in Indonesia, after failing you know, at their initial fossil fuel subsidy reforms that I was presenting at the, at the beginning, the Indonesian government decided to say, okay, we will reduce fossil fuel subsidies, so that's extra cash for the government, and we will re-inject this cash uh, uh, to individuals through cash transfers for low-income groups and public service provision. So Indonesia developed a universal healthcare system which did not exist uh, as such before this, this reform. So here you have an alliance between the ecological tax reform and some social service uh, provision. So uh, I think that's an interesting case where you can actually uh, reconcile these two, uh, these two dimensions in British Columbia uh, closer to closer, closer to us, a carbon tax was introduced in 2008, along with rebates and cash transfers to low-income and middle-income consumers. So exactly the opposite of what was done in France, for instance, where the money was used to basically give back uh, uh, checks to to the top one percent or the top five percent of the population. So there are different ways to solve uh, this this potential tension. And what we propose in the World Inequality Report is to think also out of the box. For instance, so far we've always thought about carbon taxes on consumers. What about carbon taxes on asset holders, on those who actually are investing in you know, different sectors of the economy, 
brown sectors, carbon intensive sectors or green sectors, so far there are very little financial intensive to invest in one or the other. And so a carbon pollution top up, that is a wealth tax with uh, an even higher rate if you invest in, in brown sectors, are also the types of solutions that I think we, uh, we could uh, think about before actual regulations and bans and proper uh, impossibilities to invest in brown sectors after, after some points. Let me perhaps just end with this, with this slide by saying that to tackle inequality, uh, we'll, we need to think out of the box. We also need to uh, learn from historical uh, experiences. And I think you know, what we've learned perhaps from the past two years is that um, you know, with governments in, in, in the Western world have been you know, putting together policy packages that were uh, uh, difficult to, 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 to think about a few years uh, before with strategic planning of key sectors of the economy, with you know, shutting certain countries or certain companies' access to, the fi to financial markets, to diverse from key assets and companies, track and size the assets of certain individuals. When we think about climate policy, and if we acknowledge the fact that climate change might also be a huge threat for global security, then it could become possible to envisage similar kind of measures or kind of, uh, you know, ecosystem of measures to address, uh, to address uh, climate change. And um, with, with uh, Gabriel Zuckman and, and other colleagues, uh, we recently published a, a note uh, for instance, um, showing that it's going to be very hard to effectively track um, assets of, uh, of Russian oligarchs if we do not have a proper financial asset registry. Um, and so basically uh, Im imposing effective sanction might also require the development of, uh, you know, uh, new tools to actually track uh, assets where they are, who owns them. This can also be extremely useful in the decades to come when it comes to tracking uh, investments in brown sectors of the economy. At some point, we'll be able to, to, you know, to know, public authorities will be able to know who is continuing to invest into brown sectors and to carbon in intensive sectors in other parts of the world. So here, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to be optimistic about the current situation, uh, but maybe we can try to learn from some of the policy developments and to, uh, if we have some pessimism uh, of the mind, maybe add to that some optimism of the will here uh, in terms of the policy toolkit there, there is a clear, you know, new, uh, new realm of, of, of possibilities that I think is, is opening uh, uh, thanks to what we've seen over the past two years. And I'll just finish by saying that, uh, to wrap up, in one word, what we learn in this report, in this body of work, is that inequality is essentially a political choice. It varies a lot, in fact, so much across countries and over time. There's no such thing as natural laws in economics. It's really about uh, social, institutional, social policies, institutional choices. Um, and in, in, in this context, it's extremely important for everybody to have access to transparent information about what's happening. And without that, we cannot have democratic uh, debates uh, on, on the economy. That's what we're trying to contribute in this, in this body of work. And when it comes to the environment, the key message here is going to be that it's going to be very hard to decarbonize without uh, important uh, redistribution um, to finance green investments for all and to also address this specific issue of the very large carbon footprint of, of, the, of the very wealthy. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Luca, for an incredibly uh, thorough uh, presentation. So we have a bit of time for questions. Uh, I'll, let's start with questions from, from the audience, and then uh, we can take questions from the remote uh, audience. Um, and we'll circulate a, 
a mic uh, if you want to, to say a few words. So who wants to start? Yes. Um, I guess it's working. Uh, I was wondering what could be the role of uh, government planning and economic sectors in order to address the uh, climate crisis or to plan different investments or things like that? Thanks. Um, you know, there, there, I think there are very different ways to solve the, the, the climate crisis. One way would be to, you know, um, uh, for instance, you know, from from a purely technical point of view, what uh, you know, uh, Musk is doing with with Tesla is, is is interesting. Basically, going big on a, on a sector that needs to grow the electric car, but at the same time, this you know uh, might be a very uh, you know a pretty inequality enhancing way. Uh, so the question of who is going to own these new sectors that uh, emerge through the the climate transition is is actually key. So the, the 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 issue of the ownership of the energy system, energy production, but also the distribution of energy, or the end use devices that use this energy that is produced and distributed, is, is critical. Uh, just perhaps w one example. So Sweden today is the country in the world with the highest carbon tax, and actually, you know, Swedes don't you know worry too much about the carbon tax level. That's that's fine. Uh, why? Well, largely because before the implementation of the tax in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Swedish local governments uh, invested massively in the development of um, um, local heating uh, systems. So basically, you you know you have these these forests forests harvested uh, in a sustainable manner, transformed into in local heat. So and and so that's a you know public ownership local public ownership system. That has been pretty efficient, and that's you know a government decision to do that. And you know the market was not you know uh, didn't have enough foresight at the time uh, to 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 basically anticipate that. So that's one answer to uh, I think to this to this question. Yes. Just a second, the time that we bring the, the microphone. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so from what I understood, um, you believe that uh, in order to address the climate crisis, uh, changing climate policies would take a huge part. But from my understanding of America, um, lobbying and other um, private actors influence a huge amount of policy decisions. So I was wondering what, sorry, I was wondering what thoughts you had on um, what would be the push required to actually enact those policies in the United States specifically, and also if you want to like comment generally on global issues, yeah. Let's start with the first part of the question. Um, and, um, you know, I think a big part of the lobby is actually um, uh, enhanced and made uh, uh, easier because of this, uh, uh, you know, form of alliance between those who actually really don't care about climate and those who would care about climate but who care about their incomes and who care about their work. And so the more we, uh, you know, we, we leave the inequality question aside when we talk about climate policy, uh, the more we make this alliance possible. And I think this, this is an alliance that really uh, is, is, is um, making you know, the, 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 the whole situation much more uh, complicated and, and, and will be even more complicated as uh, decarbonization needs will become even stronger even more salient. We're just at the beginning, in fact, of the of this road towards uh, towards zero emissions. We've seen that in some of the of the graphs, right? So really, it's it's key when when you look, for instance, at what has been the Democrats' proposals for you know climate change. I know there has been quite a bit of discussion here about you know Green New Deal policies. What does this? But what does this actually mean for uh, you know workers in sectors that will be impacted? Are we really sure? 
that we're putting enough cash on the table to compensate these losers. You know, my fear is that uh, what we've done in the 1990s, 2000s with trade, saying that, okay, let's open up to trade. There might be a few losers in this or that sectors. We'll take care of that, you know, as we go through, is that we repeat these kinds of mistakes. And I think this is really the kind of situation that will you know, make lobbying against climate policies even really easier for, for these actors. So my, my contribution here, it, it, it's very minimal, uh, it, it, but it's to say that uh, climate policies without strong redistribution packages are likely to fail and to, and to you know, be utilized by the, by the lobbyists in, in, in the wrong way. The good news, is that we know we can do much better than what has been done in this, in this country, including in investments and infrastructures. I know it's also complicated because of you know, the politics of this country, and I don't have an answer to solve the political politicization in the US. Sorry for that. Hello. Um, thank you for a fascinating lecture. I wanted to ask a follow-up on um, one of your last points, um, because as you were talking about the carbon tax, um, you had the one graph that you showed about offshore wealth. And I think we pretty much know that companies and, well, and very wealthy individuals are very much against paying taxes and find ways with our Swiss cheese offshore system of international finance to avoid those taxes. Um, so... Uh, it, you mentioned perhaps something like a ledger system or whatnot. If you could just expand on that and how we might come up with a uh, carbon tax system that could be um, globally embraced or at least globally enforced. Um, anyway, any ideas you have on that would be very interesting. Thanks a lot. I think, yeah, it's, it's critical here. So I would say two avenues. One is what the EU has just started to sign up for. So that's carbon tax at the border of a region. So to prevent, you know, uh, outsourcing uh, polluting activities and then re-importing stuff. Uh, so benefiting from these, you know, advantages into in, 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 uh, lo lower environmental regulations in the rest of the world. But this won't be sufficient. I, I, I think that... Um, as, as, as we move on towards, you know, 2050, one thing will, will be key is to prevent rich individuals from Europe, from North America, to invest in a business that is polluting in other parts of the world, and that may not necessarily be shipped back to rich countries, but just business that, that, that is polluting. Uh, and to continue to make a lot of money and to generate some, 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 some cash, some dividends, some, some income, some extra wealth, which can then be used wherever they want. And that's where I think that, you know, global asset registries are essential for tax purposes, for kind of standard tax purposes, wealth tax, income tax, progressivity, but could become also essential to address this issue of who invests, how we prevent individuals from investing in, uh, into these, uh, these, activity, these activities in the future. Hi, thanks for a great uh, talk. I've become very enamored with this distinction that you mentioned between pre-distribution and redistribution. So I'm hoping you can help me out with a couple of challenges with it, or that, that I've encountered with it. One is, um, isn't this distinction, or doesn't this distinction become very muddy when we start talking about actual policies? I mean, you mentioned government, government services, for example. Those could be very easily seen as redistributive as well as pre-distributive. And obviously tax, which I think it's, it makes sense to look at as redistribution, but that's obviously what also finances pre-distribution. Um, so is there any kind of any solution to that practical quagmire? And the other question is, even if the pre-distribution policies are kind of a more foundational driving force behind inequality, which I would agree with, um, isn't it possible that the taxation is still kind of the more expedient policy remedy? Thank you. No, thanks. I think this this is a fundamental point here. And I think the general message coming out from this report and this body of work is actually we, we need to think about the whole system here. And if we really want to uh, tackle inequality in the way, for instance, that 
you know, uh, Western European countries or the US was able to do between 1950 and 1980 is really this combination of taxes, progressive taxes and inv in investments in, 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 uh, in equal access to public services and regulations on the market. It's really this system. And if you remove one component, one element, the whole system collapses uh, because it's also, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of, uh, um, I didn't have time to show this graph, but uh, the rise of the social state in, in, in Europe or in, in, in the US, so rising investments in education, in health, in uh, other, you know, basic uh, public services was actually uh, um, done at the same time as the rise of, of progressive taxation. And uh, the rise of progressive taxation uh, was accepted because there was this counterpart. So they indeed go hand in hand. And of course, uh, there is also a paper by Emmanuel here and Thomas Piketty and Stefanie Stancheva about the role of taxes in, yes, reducing, uh, uh, in redistributing, so in, in reducing inequalities post-tax, but also as soon as you think uh, intertemporally in reducing inequalities before taxes. So basically if I have a very strong progressive tax today, this means that tomorrow I have less wealth to, uh, to accumulate. And so day after tomorrow I have less capital income. So taxes are also uh, one way to reduce inequalities before taxes. That being said, I think the difference between these two concepts have their limits, but can still be useful in our understanding of the, the key drivers of inequality. But bottom line, they go hand in hand. It's very hard to, to remove one component from uh, the system. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes. Well, first, I'd like to join everybody else in thanking you for your wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry you were not able to put a lot of uh, time into the, uh, the gender inequality. And I had one question about the one slide you showed. If I read it correctly, it showed a rather abysmal increase in the percentage of women's income to men. For like 30% to 37 percent over close 30, to a century. 34.7, so even less. Yeah. Um, worse, does that factor in the drastic increase in women in the workforce? So, I, I, in fact, the, this, this is a simple indicator, but the, the novelty here is that we're really trying to, to have these two uh, big dimensions of danger, uh, gender inequality together. That is the gender pay gap, which is often referred to as uh, you know, one of the leading indicators to look at uh, gender inequality. But of course, uh, if uh, you know, uh, we don't combine this with the employment ratio, so how much women are actually in the workforce, then we, w then we might be missing a big part of the picture. So this indicator combines these two elements. And, and so, I didn't have time to get into the specifics and the regional uh, you know, trajectories, but for instance, in, in European countries, what we observe is since 1990, an increase in the employment ratio, so women are more and more in the workforce. But in terms of the earnings ratio, the gender pay gap, this is more or less uh, stable. This is not necessarily what you observe in other, in other regions of, uh, of, of the world, but yes, we, we, do, we do take into account these two, these two dimensions. And the bottom line is, I think in both dimensions, uh, you know, countries and rich countries also are clearly not, not, not being as fast as they think uh, they, they are and you know, as fast as, uh, as the, re you know, the realization of this, uh, of the, of this problem uh, that we've been observing of, of the past few past few years. Uh, maybe here, just also what, one way to answer that is, is um, what we've been trying to do in this report is also to show where different facets of inequality can be articulated together and when there can be you know, some forms of policies that are able at, to address these different forms of inequality. So minimum wage policies or policies to limit the level of uh, precariousness in certain sectors of the economy particularly would be policies that reduce income inequality but also gender inequality 
because we indeed observe an over-representation of women in highly precarized uh, uh, sectors of, uh, of the economy. So here there's an alliance between uh, uh, inequality reduction and gender inequality reduction as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks all for uh, your presence. Great questions. Um, Thank you very much. On behalf of the Stone Center, thanks also to, to Jim and Cathy Stone for their continued support. And most importantly, thank you so much, Luca, for a wonderful lecture.